Well, you've pretty much done my talk for me there, so um, I'll just I'll head off. But no, thanks very much for having me here today. Um, what an incredible lineup of speakers um, you've had so far already. It's, um, it's really good to see the diversity, and hopefully some of the things I'll talk about here will be brought together, actually, in sort of real-life experiences. So, yeah, as, uh, as Neil mentioned, I, um, I, in 2013, I cycled to the South Pole, as one does. Um, and it wasn't actually something that I just stumbled across. Um, it took an awful lot of time to plan and organise the title of my uh, talk will be explained very shortly. Um, and it was actually back in over 10 years ago that my love of adventure began. And I signed up, as Neil mentioned, to run across the Sahara Desert. Um, I took part in the Marathon de Sable. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. It's six marathons in seven days across the Sahara. It was very hot, as you can imagine. I realised I really don't like heat at all. Um, there was just endless running over, um, over sand dunes like this and across salt plains. Oh, and across salt plains. And um, I, I learned about personal management. The most important thing with this expedition was look after my feet and don't get dehydrated. Um, the other thing, which I kind of just gave away, the one thing I really did learn was I've got to expect some really bad hair days. Um, if I'm going to become an adventurer, this is a combination of seven days of sweat, salt, and sand. It's really not a good look. And that's my boyfriend just lying next to me there, looking at me, wondering what on earth he's going out with. <laughs> Need I say he's now an ex-boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so as soon as I left um, the... the the, the desert, I, um, I actually started adventure racing. And I'm not sure if anyone's heard of adventure racing. It's multi-day, um, multi-discipline, um, across countries. And this is uh, an incredible photograph that was taken in a Patagonian adventure race. You can just about make out the four of us there crossing a glacier. Um, all of the events we take part in, um, teams of four, there's three guys and one girl, and we're known as a compulsory baggage in the business, and I like to uh, argue that point um, the whole way through a race. Um, again, this is a picture from Patagonia, and um, I just absolutely fell in love with adventure racing because uh, you just get to cross some of the most incredible terrain that's untouched by humans and sometimes untouched by animals. And... Um, so, yeah, in, um, in 2010, I decided to actually um, give up my um, career. I'd been working in um, the corporate world for 10 years, and um, I actually decided to set off on a bit of a journey across New Zealand to cycle a length of the country. I do all of my best thinking from the seat of my bike, and um, I set off on this journey to cycle the length of the country to, number one, develop my business plan for setting up my new business. But also, it was on this journey that I found out that nobody had ever cycled to the South Pole before, and I love to do things first, so I thought this is a very good goal to set myself. However, this expedition was very much surrounded by by doubt, because it had never been done before. I had no idea whether it was possible. And I didn't really have any experience at all. And I, I kind of recall when I was at school, and I was not a very intelligent person at all. I really struggled with education, but I absolutely adored mathematics. And my teacher said to me, you know, you must just, after GCSE, just just give up on, on maths and do something else. And I absolutely persisted, and I, um, I got my A-level, I went on to university and I got a degree in maths, and then I actually applied my mathematics in my first career um, in rocket science, as uh, Neil mentioned. So, you know, it was one of those things that, and I think as John mentioned before, sometimes you can be your very own monster, and that was the case. I had to control the doubt that I had in myself to make sure that I wasn't going to get in the way of my, my end goal. So I left New Zealand with a big plan, I'm going to cycle to the South Pole. And, like I said, I didn't have any experience at all, and so I thought, right, I need to find some really challenging expedition that I'm really going to put myself through, um, through the motions of what it could be like. So I signed up for a race called the Siberian Black Ice Race. And this is a picture on the left-hand side of Lake Baikal, and the idea was to cycle from the south all the way to the north. And the ice was literally cracking underneath my tyres, and the wolves were howling in the surrounding mountains. It was the most incredible and perfect um, like 
practice training run for the South Pole, and I was taking part as a solo as well, so I was on my own. Um, it was the most horrendously dangerous thing I've ever done in my life. It ran once, and it's never run, bef run again. <laughs> and out of 30 people that started the race, only eight of us finished. People fell through the ice, people had hypothermia, frostbite, all sorts. It was a complete disaster, but it was brilliant. <laughs> and I... <al> <laughs> And I also learned about uh, winter cycling. And in some areas, it was very good smooth ice to cycle on. In other areas, it was very broken ice. Also, in some areas, it was deep, soft snow. So I learned about the dynamics of cycling a normal two-wheel bike across this kind of terrain. And basically, it doesn't work. As you can imagine, trying to cycle across that is virtually impossible. So as soon as I got home, I... Uh, I decided, right, I need to set up a team of experts who can help me develop a, a cycle um, that's going to get me to the South Pole. So we sat down, we came up with this superb looking contraption. It's three wheels for stability, because in deep soft snow, um, being on two wheels is, is very, very difficult and you end up falling off. Recumbent position for the aerodynamics, and also I needed to have some kind of weight bearing capability because I was going to be carrying about 50 kilograms worth of kit. So this is a picture taken from Iceland on the Langjökull Glacier. Um, again, the training was great, but um, there was also times when it became very, very challenging. So that whole control of doubt was something I really needed to focus on. So time came and I was ready. What I've just summarised there in about five minutes took four years of planning, training, um, a lot of tears, a lot of panic, a lot of everything going on. And I finally set off. And I actually left from the Rossi shelf, which is just on the bottom. You can just see on the, the southern part there. Um, and I had the transantarctic mountain range to climb up through to get to the South Pole. So yeah, I, I mean, Antarctica is an incredible place and it's something that I'd been looking at for, for many, many years. So the route I decided to go was the same side of Antarctica that Scott and Amazon set off from, um, gosh, over 100 years ago now. So I was really privileged to have had the opportunity to you know, see what they had seen as well. So I set off on my own on my polar cycle with 20 days worth of rations. Um, I had about 55 kilograms worth of kit strapped on the back of that polar cycle. And I knew that I had to climb up this mountain range. Believe it or not, the South Pole sits at 3,000 metres. It's a mountain. And I had to climb up through that in order to get onto the polar plateau to get there. And on some days, actually, um, because I, you can just about in this picture make out the transantarctic mountain range, it would creep up on my right-hand side. And when the weather sort of changed, which it did within hours, it would all of a sudden, the visibility would disappear. It was actually a real relief not to be able to see those mountains because I was panicking. Um, it was going to be a real challenge, and th this was the thing that was the big, the big crux of the expedition. This was a Leverett Glacier which I'd chosen to climb up. It was one of the glaciers that pour off the polar plateau. And in areas, it was about 20% gradient. So if you can imagine that on just a road, that's quite a steep climb. It took me three days, a lot of, um, a lot of hard work to climb up that glacier. And I'd actually had, for the six months leading up to this expedition, I'd had a reoccurring nightmare that I'd cycle all the way to the top, I'd fall off the polar cycle, the polar cycle would roll all the way back down to the bottom, I'd run all the way down, I'd get back on and cycle it all the way back up again. And that was reoccurring about seven, eight times every night for six months. So, as you can imagine, I was in a right state trying to cycle up this thing. But I managed it, it was very slow, point 1.2 of a kilometre at times, it was, it was painfully slow. I did manage to get to the top, luckily. And this is how I spent my evening. So I'd cycle up to about 17 hours every single day, and, um, and then I'd have a few hours in my tent at night. And this, I, I loved my tent. This was my home. It was the most incredible place to be. And I loved the, the, the routine as well. In Antarctica, you have to be so strict with yourself. You really have to focus on um, the, the time, you know, the time that you've got um, when you're in the tent. And I loved 
getting to grips with the, um, the water making process. So I had limited fuel and I needed to make water out of the snow and ice to rehydrate my food at night. Um, and it was just a real challenge to use minimum fuel, maximum water each time. And it was actually quite luxurious because I had a three course dinner every night. You know, I don't skip on food, I like my food. But the mushroom soup as a starter every day got quite boring. Main course is a sort of chicken korma or a spaghetti bolognese or something, and then a really luxurious chocolate dessert. But disaster absolutely struck on day two and I broke my spoon and I had to then eat my three-course meal with my hands. So it became quite messy. As you can see, I've tied the tent to the polar cycle there because winds would just pick up incredibly out of nowhere. And uh, the one thing I couldn't afford to lose was the polar cycle. So once up onto the polar plateau, things actually got very tough because there was a lot of um, snow that had blown around and caused quite deep snow drift in places. And you can see the three tracks that I'm creating here. And at this stage, I was wishing I had just a normal bike because then that would just be one track I'd be making. And also because of the exertions I'd had cycling up um, the Leverett Glacier, I was really suffering from knee pain at this stage. It was, it was something that I'd started in, in Siberia, believe it or not, but um, I thought painkillers would do the job. Um, but yeah, it started to get quite bad and was, was, was very challenging. But the other thing about the polar plateau was it's the most incredible amount of nothingness you've ever seen or experienced. And in today's day and age, we are stimulated all the time, 24-7, by things. And it was such a unique experience to, to be out there and hear nothing and see nothing. And, and I was able to completely switch off and spend, you know, 5, 10, 50 minutes at a time thinking about nothing. Now, if you, can, if you try and do that, in this society, it's, it's just not possible, you know? You can maybe do a couple of seconds, but out there, it was just the most incredible experience. At times, though, I did come across things like this. This is what I call Antarctica art. It's sastrugi, it's wind-blown snow that's just frozen. As it's blown, it's so cold, it just freezes in situ. And it sort of lulled me into this false sense of security because that looks absolutely beautiful, but it reminded me that how vicious yet how beautiful Antarctica is. It really is a, a place you've got to be quite, you know, quite wary of. So just skipping back to food again, because that's obviously really important. This is a picture from inside my... I had a bum bag on my front, and it sounds repulsive, but there's a combination of salted licorice, beef fat, chocolate, pretzels, jelly beans, bultong, all sorts of things like that. And it was the best part of the day, just putting my hand in that bag and seeing what I was going to pull out. These are the kind of things that kept me entertained. <laughs> like I've mentioned before, it was freezing up on the polar plateau. With the wind chill, it was you know, below minus 40 degrees, so I had to be completely head to toe covered. You can see the condensation from my breath there that's, that's uh, formed on the face mask. And at one night, because um, I, I made a point of taking a photograph of my face each day just to check that you know, everything was still there. And one day, some frostbite had started to develop on my cheek. So luckily, I caught it in time. Plus, a bit of makeup hopefully does the job. So on the 27th of December, I did finally arrive at the South Pole, having become the first person in the world um, to cycle to the South Pole, which was an just the most incredible um, feeling. And I do have a quick show reel, which hopefully will just summarize a little bit of uh, my ramble. Hopefully this will work. I'd had the idea of cycling to the South Pole um, for quite a long time. I knew that nobody had ever done it. Well, I mean, we, we used to go into bed and thinking, oh, I wonder where Maria is <laughs> now. Welcome to the Antarctica! Show me what you've got. I can't wait to see it. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. 
If this machine fails, she fails. So it's got to survive. It's been one hell of an expedition just to get to the start line. Um, in the last 24 hours, I've had altitude sickness. I've met Prince Harry. I've traveled for 19 hours overland uh, across a crevasse-ridden um, glacier, an ice cap. Having seen part of the route today, um, I mean, this is going to be one hell of a challenge. How are you? Good to see you. Things well? Yeah, very well. Marie is you know, a good athlete to work with because all of these elements really weigh in in some way to you know, ultra-endurance challenges. Up on the Parla Plateau, it's, it's minus 30, minus 40 with the wind chill. Sometimes when I was working hard and my feet would sweat, it would then very, very quickly turn to ice. I can't believe I'm here. I've just got to, the next two days, I'll just get up here. God, I hope I can get up. absolutely just gone and every pedal stroke is so painful that it's just it's just excruciating and I mean I almost got to a point where I was just like I can't do it anymore but um, I'm now less than 200 miles sorry I can't breathe because I'm so I'm almost at 3,000 meters and so it's not a lot of oxygen in the air up here away from the South Pole. There's the South Pole. I just couldn't quite believe that not only was I the first to cycle to the South Pole, but I'd also managed to cycle every single meter um, of the way. Well done, you just cycled into the history books. <laughs> <laughs> bit, of, bit of excitement at the end there. <laughs> so very quickly, so the four years of planning um, it was just came to, to a perfect end because I got my stamp in the in my South Pole stamp in my passport. I met a Prince, as you saw, Prince Harry, and I achieved a, a double uh, world record um, for the first and also the fastest human powered to the South Pole. And of course, the you know the the, the four years of of doubt, fear, and of course terrible hair was absolutely worth it. That was at Union Glacier, just about to fly out after a month of uh, of Antarctica. So. Thank you very much. <laughs>